Is America's Obesity Epidemic a Symptom of Food Addictions? Learn what this author and Ph.D. candidate in nutrition can teach us about the excessive consumption of sugars and flours. Next on Living Smart. Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. Hello, I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest, Joan Eflin, is the CEO of the Sugars and Flowers Project and a doctoral student in nutrition. What's wrong with sugars and flowers? Joan tells us they may cause addiction. A lecturer and teacher, Joan has studied foods and their ingredients extensively. Today, she'll share cutting-edge research on why the environment we live in contributes to the obesity epidemic and what we can do about it. Why is cocaine sold in powdered form? Because you get high faster. Well, that is the same reason why this country is eating a pound a day of sugars and flowers and not a pound a day of vegetables because the sugars and flowers make us high. Joan Iflin is on a mission. You're about to do something to For me. her, the reason why America is facing an obesity epidemic is clear, addiction to sugars and flowers. Americans eat on average a pound of sugars and flowers per person per day. And that number rises after the tobacco companies take over the food manufacturers. And of course, tobacco companies know this business. You put a highly addictive substance in a socially acceptable retail product, and you market the heck out of it. That is a formula for success. That's what they've done with the sugars and flowers business. In the mid-1980s, sugar and flour consumption began to increase dramatically. And you see the obesity problem follow right behind. Diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, depression especially. 65% of Americans are now significantly overweight. To me, that's a good indication that there is some degree of addiction going on. Good girl. At least that is what Iflan found out on her own while trying to find a solution to all her ailments 10 years ago. I was crazy, sick, and fat. I had asthma, I had sinus headaches, I had terrible allergies, and I was 30 pounds overweight. And I say, by the grace of God, I had that weight problem because that got me into a 12-step program for sugars and flowers. So during the next eight years, Iflin lost 30 pounds and began to teach, write, cook, and coach others about addiction to sugars and flowers. The main problem was that I had an addiction. I was addicted to refined carbohydrates. It's not surprising in retrospect because, of course, alcohol is a refined carbohydrate. People become addicted to that. Sugars and flowers are not very different. They're sold in powdered form. They get into the bloodstream very quickly. We get high from them. And then in the crash, we use them compulsively. And that's the description of an addiction. In her book, Sugars and Flowers, Evelyn shows how Americans' blood sugar goes up and down during the day from what they eat. Each time you eat a refined carbohydrate or sugar product, your glucose goes up and then quickly comes down. She is now in the process of getting her Ph.D. in addiction to sugars and flowers to prove her point. Here is why America has a weight problem. Here's the whole secret. Insulin works to reduce high blood sugar by taking the blood sugar out of the bloodstream and putting it into fat cells. So as America goes through their pound per person per day, they're just constantly packing blood glucose into fat cells. So the insulin does a great job. It takes the blood sugar out of the bloodstream and crash. Now within 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, my blood sugar is too low and my brain begins to starve. If then began her program by getting off sugars and flowers completely and teaching others how to create a food plan to avoid them. We teach people how to prepare, how to store, how to make their food beautiful. It's a protein, a starch, and a vegetable. Enormously simple. Iflin also takes some of her clients to fast food restaurants such as Beck's Prime to show them what they are allowed to eat and what they should avoid. So the key here is that they, it's not pre-processed food. They handle everything naturally. Iflin has coached and taught over a thousand Houstonians. That's a breakfast and a burrito, but you can just scrape the breakfast out. She said, let's write a menu. And she started me immediately. 
And I started, and it was wonderful. I started to feel better immediately. I've been on this plan now for five months, and I've lost 20 pounds. This woman who wished to remain anonymous says she beat her eating disorder through the food plan. Um, what I noticed was that I stopped obsessing about what I ate, that I no longer have this continuous debate in my mind about what I will eat, is it good, is it bad, my self-esteem doesn't go up and down 50 times a day over what I've eaten, what I might eat, what I should have done, what I shouldn't have done. Now Iflin's main concern is how food companies misinform people, and especially children, about what they eat. A child cannot distinguish between a commercial and a programming until they're about six years old. By then it's too late. An accepted addiction tenet is that you can addict any animal to any addictive substance if you do two things. You give the animal the substance often enough and you start them fairly young. Now, the first thing you see that happens when those tobacco companies take over the food manufacturers, Saturday morning cartoons for sugared products in a short seven years goes up fivefold. Today, Joan and her family's diet is completely free of sugars and flours. She claims the diet not only made everyone in her family smarter, but also nicer. A general uh, level of wellness in our household has improved dramatically. Uh, the number of prescriptions that we have filled on an annual basis is probably a quarter or, or less than that, maybe, maybe a fifth of what it used to be. Uh, we're just not getting sick. Thank you so much, Joan Niflin, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Patty. And I know you keep studying the subject over and over and over, but do you think as Americans we're closer to understanding food addiction now? Yes, we are. Uh, there is more research coming out. There are the laboratory studies that need to be done first. I am conducting research. We are getting closer. Tell me about the research that you've conducted. What are some of the interesting things you found about well, it? Well, it's very exciting. Uh, in co cooperation with St. Stephen Presbyterian Church, we have been following a group of people who eliminated processed foods from their diets about eight months ago. And what we see is that the addictive behaviors that they exhibited six or eight months ago are disappearing. And, and they're feeling better, and you're, as you said, yes. their craving is gone. Their cravings are gone, and also the consequences are going. The diabetes is going, the high blood pressure, the cholesterol, and, of course, the weight. Energy is coming up. These are very standard things that we see when people eliminate processed foods from their diets. You know, I always wondered, um, does everybody get it? You know, some people don't get addicted to alcohol. Does everybody get addicted to food? Well, that's, a, that's very interesting. There is now a, it's a study in rats about what happens to rats when they are exposed to addictive substances for a long time. It's called prolonged exposure or prolonged access. And I think that's what we have in this country. We can get processed foods all the time. They're advertised to us freely. And it sets us up for the addictive behavior, even if we're not addicts, per so se. So eventually, because there's so much of it out there. Exactly. Do you have any idea how widespread food addiction is? Well, look at the fact that almost two-thirds of Americans are overweight. And overweight is something that in our new research, this is not released yet. It's two very small samples, but it's very consistent that uh, overweight and addictive behaviors are correlating very closely. So I think, you know, you can, it would be easy to project, and I don't have the data yet, but it would be easy to project that these two-thirds of Americans who have a weight problem are probably using foods in an addictive pattern. In a, an addictive way, right. Yes. They're eating it all the time. And, um, and, and you want more and more and more, which is part you of the addiction. You want more and more, the, yes. And you have consequences, and you're eating in spite of consequences. You eat more than you intended. You, you miss events so that you can go eat. You spend time going to get the food and then recovering from it. So there are definite behaviors that are addictive. And we see what we are seeing is that people are engaged in those behaviors around processed foods. So there are similarities between, let's say, food addiction and alcoholism? Absolutely. In the behavior and probably also in the biochemistry. That's something that remains to be seen. When you say biochemistry, you mentioned that alcohol is a little bit like carbohydrate, like processed carbohydrate. Yes, yes. Well, what we now see, and this is so clear, 
It was a study done at the Brookhaven Institute in New York where they did MRIs, you know, brain images, of methamphetamine abusers and obese people. Mm -hmm. And what they saw in both images, both sets of images, were diminished dopamine fields. And that is a hallmark of a substance-related addiction. This is not a behavioral addiction like gambling or sex or shopping. This is a substance-based addiction. There's a chemistry pattern that goes inside your body yes. that, that we are aware yes. of now. in reaction to the substance. Right, because dopamine, what does dopamine do? It, 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 dopamine it's... is a pleasurable neurotransmitter, and the theory behind an addiction is that you get high from the presence of excessive neurotransmitters, from excessive dopamine. It's pleasurable, it's fun, you feel great, and then you crash, and in the crash you, is the compulsion, where you would just want to use the substance because you feel so bad, you don't have enough dopamine or serotonin or beta endorphin, and you use, you use compulsively to feel better. Then over time that function wears out, and it takes more substance to create the same effect. That is the hallmark. That is keep, one of the hallmarks of an addiction, a substance-based right. addiction. You keep eating more and more in this case. To feel the same. What other diseases are tied to food addiction? Well, clearly, I think what we're going to see from our data is that we will see the diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and heart disease. We, we, this is unpublished data. It's two small samples, but very consistent. Are all foods addictive? I mean, you talk about sugars and flowers. Are all foods addictive somewhat? No, because you have to show the presence of harm. You have to show a, a disease or an illness as a consequence. So spinach is not making anybody, you know, it's not giving them diabetes or, or weight problems. None of the plants, none of the unprocessed plants do that. Uh, there are some questions about meats, but I don't think meat is the big problem in our American culture, I believe it's processed foods. Are some communities more vulnerable than others to food addiction? That's very interesting, Patty. What we see when we look at the way the tobacco companies advertise is that they prey on uneducated populations. So, for example, in uh, some, you'll see in um, magazines, you'll see lots of cigarette ads or, or more than magazines that are aimed at a, a higher, higher socioeconomic strata. So, yes, and I also believe that we now are seeing evidence that the food manufacturers are preying on children. So a big issue is how exposed are children to the food and also to advertising for the food. Well, we do notice in advertising that uh, cigarette companies are still going to the third world countries to advertise yes. much more than they do here. Yes. Um, do you think addictive food should be regulated like cigarettes? When the public is ready, you know, not before then. But it wasn't until people really got that cigarettes caused lung cancer and heart disease that the, that the society became willing to infringe on one of our most precious rights. It's the First Amendment. It's the freedom of speech. When the culture is fully aware of how damaging these processed foods are and how addictive they are, that's a key point, that people have lost control. When the society as a whole understands that, accepts it, then we'll have the movement, movement towards regulation. I think most people know processed foods are not good for them, but the addiction part is something new. Yes, right? and that is where you will, I believe, the motivation to control advertising will come from. The, the, the loss of control. Until you get that, what you have is, oh, you're taking away my right to have this information. And once you can shift that over into, oh, what you're really taking away is the food company's right to trigger my impulse, mm -hmm. then you can have the shift. But how big of uh, part of the economy are food manufacturing companies? It's a very different situation than tobacco. It's a much bigger portion of the economy. I think it's more like uh, one-sixth of the of entire economy. U.S. economy is engaged in processing food. Are they changing their ways in any way? They claim that they are changing their ways, but Marion Nessel, who is the chair of the New, New York University Nutrition Department, has just released a study that was commissioned by the World Health Organization addressing the question, are they making meaningful changes? Mm -hmm. They say they're making changes. They say they're improving the formulation of their products by reducing fat, reducing salt. It is not meaningful. 
Marion's bottom line was they are paying lip service to changes without making meaningful changes. If I'm watching this program and I'm thinking, am I a food addict? How do I know that I'm addicted to sugars and flowers? How do I find out? Okay, you can, um, first of all, you can go to St. Stephen Presbyterian Church. They, we do have an ongoing program there. It is the first community-based food addiction intervention in the country. Interesting. Very, very successful. There are a group of enthusiastic food plan workers there. and It's just, it's been thrilling. I did my internship there and it okay. just worked out great. The, uh, so that is a great place to go for help now. Leisure Learning has a class. Uh, course number 5551, right. Sugars and Flowers, How They Make Us Crazy, Sick and Fat. And of course they can call me. I do have a private practice. I think working this in community is much more effective than with an individual, but I'm, I'm helping, happy to help people individually. But if there are things that they need to know okay. about their life, let's say they can't come see you or they're yes. not in Houston, yes. what are some of the things that they need to know to go get help somewhere? Very good. Um, this is not yet a diagnosis, so you can't go into a doctor's office and get this diagnosis. That's one of the things that we're working on so hard in our research is to define the syndrome. So you can go get a diagnosis, but we're not there yet. So people should say, uh, you know, do I eat more than I planned? Uh, do I avoid social situations in order to go eat? Am I unable to perform basic like life functions because of the consequences of the way I eat? Uh, am I eating more than I used to? That's the progression. Do I eat to correct a low feeling that is not hunger? Do I eat because of restless cravings? Those are all signs of addictive behavior. If you realize you're a food addict, what kind of treatment do you get? Do you go you, to AA? You can. Oh, well, the great, the, there's a great resource, which is foodaddictsinrecovery.com. Okay. It's a 12-step group. It's where I have learned so much, and it is on the web, foodaddictsinrecovery.com. And then you can find out about that from anywhere. Well, And the treatment is to eliminate the foods that are driving you crazy. How quickly do you notice the difference once you stop eating sugars no, and flowers? That is, I'm glad you asked that question. I was just reading a research report the other day about alcohol withdrawal. It's a four-day withdrawal. And that's what I have seen in my clinic, and that's what I want to demonstrate in my research. I want to, to take that into rigorous scientific evaluation. It's a four-day withdrawal now, in my experience. Did you find any shocking information? Because you've been studying this for years. Yes. Now you're getting your Ph.D. It was something that grabbed you and said, my Lord, I didn't know this, because I know you already yes. knew a lot before you started working on your Ph.D. Patty, it brought tears to my eyes. The first time I saw in numbers what my clients go through. They're too tired to exercise. Uh, they are engaged in this addiction all day long. I mean, it, it is, it's a devastating, all-encompassing all disease at the most severe end. And of course, there is a range of severity. Some people, you know, they compulsively pick up a candy bar once a week. That's not a, that's not a severe addiction. Maybe it gives them a little pimple or something, right. but that's not grave consequences, but it goes all the way to the person whose life has been devastated, and that was something that really brought tears to my eyes when I saw how systematic how much it is. Yes. Where does your research take you now? I mean, I know you're a campaigner for this. Yes, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the research, Patty. I'm moving away from private practice into research because there is not enough research out there. We need to get this diagnosis established. We need to do the big epidemiological studies so that we can determine prevalence and so that we can really nail this, the symptoms. We need to do withdrawal studies. We need to take people in a, in a safe place, get them through withdrawal, document the course of withdrawal, which I think is going to be very standard, and then reintroduce the substances, which is hard research to do because I know the people will be sick. And then we will take the substances away and watch the withdrawal again. And that's how you do withdrawal studies. Do you see it as a disease, yes. a relapse disease? Yes, it is absolutely a relapse disease. 
isn't it very difficult for you, because I know you don't need any sugars and flowers, yeah. to say, I will never, ever, ever, which is what alcoholics have to do or drug addicts, drug addicts have to do, I will never, ever eat a sugar or flour for the rest of my life. You know, today, Patty, when I think that thought, I think I just, you know, thank my higher power. Ten years ago, when I thought that thought, the hairs would stand up Gross. on the back How of my can neck. You do yes. this, oh, right? no, I can't bear this. But you know, that thought drove me to create recipes. Okay. So I have ice cream recipes and I have muffin recipes, but they're made with unprocessed foods. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Let's say I want something sweet, but yeah. it doesn't have sugar in it. What do you What do you use? Fruit. Okay. You know, but you're what, when you when you say that I want something fruit, sweet, that's a craving. Okay. And it's very hard for people to imagine life without cravings. Right. But when you eat unprocessed foods regularly, in balance, proteins and carbohydrates all throughout the day, three and a half times a day, you don't have cravings. And that is a life that most Americans have never experienced. We don't know what that's like. Yeah. Now, let's say I want ice cream. But you say you fix ice cream. What do you fix it with? Because it has to taste sweet, right? Well, I fix it with milk and eggs and fruit. And ah, you fix it with fruit, okay. Yeah, so when you blend that up. Now, the other really wonderful thing that happens when you get off of these refined foods is that your sense of taste comes back. So something that might not taste too sweet today in six months will be very satisfying. So a combination of eggs and milk and strawberries, you know, mixed up, cooked, and then put into a, an ice cream maker makes wonderful ice cream. And we eat that for breakfast. What about drinks? I mean... Do you use sweeteners? Because some of those are not healthy either. I don't use any sweeteners myself. And if a client needs to use a sweetener in transition as they come off the processed foods, I recommend stevia, but only for six months or so because any kind of concentrated sweetener can become addictive. So you suggest maybe just don't use anything at all. Like you have you tea or have it. coffee without any sweetener or sugar. If you can Which is what it. I've learned to do. Yes. My Good. Colombian friend told me to do that. Yeah. Now, what do you, why, who do you think is interested in this m information not getting out? Not getting out. Well, you just look at what has happened to the tobacco manufacturers when tobacco was proven to be addictive in combination with the full extent of harm. You just think about what have the tobacco manufacturers gone through, and they were not targeting small children. I think that there is a possibility that if this syndrome is fully established, the food manufacturers will go through that same process. And of course they don't want to do that. What kinds of food help you maintain that glucose level steady uh, better than others. I'm sure like there are fruits that are better than others in this case as well. There are some fruits that have more, yes. not sugar, but fructose than others, right? Yes, yes, good. There are low sugar fruits and uh, eating those in combination with a protein, always in combination with a protein because that will slow down the absorption. You, Interesting. You want your carbohydrate to last for four or five hours. You get four or five hours of freedom from thinking about food right. when you do that. Uh, fiber also, so you want to eat your foods in an as intact condition as possible. Right, as organic yeah, as under, possible. Yeah, undercooked uh, to the extent possible. But you also want to eat a starch. I mean, this whole thing of low-carbohydrate diets is not healthy, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's better to eat a starch that is only cooked to the point where you can enjoy it, and uh, not powdered, you know, not made into a flour. And then that works beautifully. Give me an example of a great meal, because you, you mentioned some fruits. Like, I, I understand berries and strawberries. Anything that's a berry is better than, uh, has great antioxidants, but also has a low sugar glycemic yes, index. Yes, yes. Apples, uh, pears, peaches, nectarines, pr uh, not prunes, uh, apricots, um, all the berries, cantaloupe, pineapple, those are low sugar, relatively low sugar fruits. And, and not everybody can eat all of those. But say breakfast would be um, two eggs, a bowl of oatmeal, a cup of milk, and a cup of fruit. And that sounds like a lot of food, but it will hold you all afternoon and it will prevent the cravings that come in the late afternoon and evening. Lunch could be a steak, chicken, fish, a pork chop, turkey, 
beans for protein, two cups of vegetables, and then any one of the starches, potatoes, a grain, sweet potato, uh, lots of there's things. There's a lot of choices. Now tell me, how do you know you're living smart? Because you know where your food came from. You can identify the plant or the animal that it came from. Do you think that this really changed your life and your family's life? 180 completely. degrees. What was the best part of it? The lack of fighting, the decrease in fighting. We were irritable You're people. You're nice to each other now. We are much nicer to each other, and my children were able to study, and I have, my children are now 22 and 23. They have enormously successful lives, and we, we just enjoy each other. They're just smarter than anybody, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. I like to think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. Thanks, Patty. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and for more information on Joan Iflin, you can check our website at houstonpbs.org slash living smart. There you'll also find a complete resource list. And feel free to share your own views on food addiction. You can call us with your comments at 713-743-8513 or email livingsmart at houstonpbs.org. And that's our show for today. Remember to eat well and live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great week. Thank you. Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.